Hi, everybody. I'm Diana. Welcome to this week's episode of the Quilting Library from So In Common. I hope you all are doing well. Um, this week is our third block for the month of August. So we're whipping through August already. Who knew, right? These months seem to be going right really quick. Zip, zip, zoom, as I say here at the house. Please get that done. Zip, zip, zoom. That's, you ask my family, they're like, oh, yeah, that's her. That's her. Zip, zip, zip. Anyway, um, so this week we're going to do the windmill block. It's kind of a pretty block, I think. You can kind of see the whole windmill idea on here. I like this one. And um, I'm going to give you the information verbally on what you need to make this block. I will also type it in the description down below, okay? Please, if you enjoyed the Quilting Library or any of my other series, Good Gadgets or So In Common, please click the subscribe button and click the little bell so that you can get notified when I add new content. That way, that way you'll know when new stuff comes out. I would super appreciate it. I am like 13, 12, something like that, away from 3,000 subscribers. I'm like, super jazzed about that. So if you could help me out, that would be great. Um, but really, you know, I, I want you to do that because you enjoy the content that I'm bringing to you for sure. Because I know I appreciate you all so much. And I know that you have so many other options for your content, for your quilting and your sewing and your stitching. And by all means, watch a combination of everything because there's so much information and good stuff out there. Um, I myself, I got like lists of people I watch and talk to and stuff like that. So it's um, helpful. It's a community, right? All right. So that would be great. Thank you so much. All right. So you got your little pencil and your little piece of paper. I'm going to tell you what you need to make le bloc. Okay. Alrighty, so you're going to need three fabrics, fabric A, B, and C. Fabric A, you will need six five inch squares. Fabric B, fabric B is what we're going to consider the background fabric. You will need six five inch squares. And fabric C, you are going to need four five inch squares. So that's pretty easy. Let's take a look at this again because I'm betting you're thinking, oh, this is this this looks complicated. Let me grab a, a little design board over here. It might hold it up better. It might hold it flatter. Let me. There we go. So here's the design board. So here's the block. It might look like it's complicated. You're like, oh, diamonds and stuff like that. Nope, not at all. This is all made with half square triangles. That's, that's it. It's a super easy block in that respect. It's another one of the star blocks. August is kind of our star block month. Um, we started out with, um, gosh, I can't remember which ones we've started out with already because I've already put them away. But we've already had two star blocks. Oh, the first one was an eight-pointed star, kind of a faux Lemoyne star. Um, last week, we actually didn't do a star. That's right. We did the Illinois journey block and I hope you enjoyed that one. It was a little late coming out in the week because of life. We'll just put it that way. It was because of life. So it came out a little later last week and I appreciate you going with me on that. Um, but it's out. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, maybe you have two to watch now. That would be fun, right? Or some of our older ones, that would be great too. Um, but other than that Illinois journey block, all the other three blocks this month are all some sort of a star block. And you'll see star blocks a lot because star blocks are really prevalent throughout the entire quilting um, community. So this is at the windmill. But I know it looks like it could be difficult and you've got funky angles and all that, but really, no, it's just half square triangles in rows. And it, it's based on how you put your half square triangles together. That's all it is. So it's going to be easy. Um, I wanted to show you one little project. I'm not even going to do this in a good gadget because I've already shown you folks this little contraption for cutting your strings when you chain pieced a bunch of stuff. Well, this last month in, um, sorry, I have strings on me. 
I'm always, I know I shouldn't pick them off because they're always on here somewhere. I mean, that's just the way it is. <laughs> um, but in a, in a monthly subscription box that I get this last month, we got this little product called String Blade. They kind of look like little um, irons, don't they? But they have a little sticky back piece that you peel off and you stick this somewhere. And inside this teeny tiny little bit right here is a blade, just like here, for you to cut all your strings and stuff. And there's three in the packet. I haven't taken mine out yet because I don't know where I want to put them. But I'm thinking I'm going to put one over by the sewing machine itself because sometimes uh, when I'm just sewing for me, I drag the iron and the mat and everything over there and do everything. So I'm not up and down and up and down. Although I should do the up and down, up and down, right? Because I get my steps in that way. <laughs> um, and then um, I have this one here. So I don't know yet. This might be nice to take with me when I start traveling again. I don't know. I haven't decided, but I think they'll come in handy because although it took me forever to start using this, once I did start, I use it all the time now. I really like it instead of my snips. So you never know, right? What's, you know, when you're going to find something new. Okay, so that was a little product I thought, because it kind of goes, because we're going to be doing a lot of half square triangles. So we're going to be doing a lot of little snips and cuts. Okay, so now I want to show you how you need to group these fabrics. You cut all your squares. You have six of fabric A, six of fabric B, and four of fabric C. They're all five inch squares. That's easy to remember. You might also want to have your half square triangle trimmer ruler, whatever you use for trimming up half square triangles. I use the quilt in the day ruler. Um, you can also use just a square ruler to trim up however you square up your half square triangles because we're going to square all of these up to four and a half inches, okay? Alrighty. So um, you might want to have that handy for after we get them all sewn up. So here's how we're going to put them together. We are going to do four sets of block A and block B. So let me set our completed one right over here. So I'm going to pull these out and I'm going to show you my. So this is my fabric B. That's going to be quote unquote my background fabric. And this is fabric A. Okay, I'm going to give these to a little press here. When I cut them, they were close to a fold and I never fully pressed it before. Um, if you pre-starch your fabrics and stuff, please do whatever you normally do. That's fine. Um, I don't starch like that. Um, I might do a little spray sizing and stuff um, for seams. I use my conditioning pen for seams, but I don't spray everything stiff. So that process is a process. If you do it or want to do it, um, you can do that. You can do that on your own, okay? Um, so we're gonna have four sets of A, B blocks. And you might as well, when you put them together, put them right sides together. So I was doing a block a couple weeks ago and I thought I had them all right sides together. I didn't, I ended up doing them all back to front. I picked out more stitches that week. It was a really bizarre week. I was sewing everything backwards, not putting them together. It was crazy, crazy, crazy. Sometimes those things happen. That's why we have seam rippers. <laughs> okay, so I have my four sets of my AB blocks. Then we want two sets of BC blocks. Ooh, BC. So the B block or the background block and the C block. Now my C block is a super duper light misty Oh, sea glass color, I suppose you could say, but it kind of melds in with the aquas and stuff in here. It's really hard to see on camera, I know. It's actually kind of hard to see like in person here because it's a very light color with a very, but I wanted something that would kind of read as a solid for my C block or yeah, my C block. So this is my C block. I want to make sure I have the right side. Yeah, it's the back because it's so light. So that's my front. There's my B block. I'm gonna give this B block a little press too. 
There we go. So, and I'm going to put these two sets together, right sides together, just like I had said for my other sets. I'm going to give this one a press. I thought these didn't need much pressing, but a few of them did. All righty. Okay. So I have my BC sets, that's two. Set those over there. Now I want two AC block sets, okay? So my A block and my C block, right sides together. And we're going to have two sets of those as well. So see, this is already coming together. So super simple, right? You could, this block could be done in a much more difficult manner. Here, I think that's easier for you to see. Could be done in a far more difficult manner. You could end up doing stuff, but doing it with half square triangles just takes all the difficulty out of it. So again, you know, your experience is a great way to get a bunch of blocks turned out right? You can get them done quick. Um, if you're a beginner, these are great blocks because you're dealing with that primary um, block that we use in quilting, in quilt piecing, which is the half square triangle. Okay. I think I need to, I need to cut my bangs. I'm making me nuts. All righty. So we have all of our sets here. Now we're going to do that thing. I tell you every time we do half square triangles, we're going to mark them. I'm going to use my magic wand and I have a marker. It's this isn't going to be seen, so I don't care. So I'm using a very thin line Sharpie, see, really thin line Sharpie, but I'm doing that so you all can see the marks because I know normally I use a pencil or what I would ever I would use when I'm doing my own stitching and I I have been realizing you guys can't see those marks and I apologize for that. So on my demo pieces, I'll use this little thin line dark marker and you'll see it. All right, so I'm gonna flip the camera to the overhead and we'll mark these up, okay? So this is my AB block set and I have four of these to mark. And you can mark yours however you mark for making two half square triangles. Do you use a magic wand like I do, or do you just go from diagonal point to diagonal point and then stitch a quarter inch on each line? That's fine too. Whatever is the easiest for you, whatever you're used to. So I've got my blocks right sides together. Yes, I'm just double checking. Okie dokie, hold those down. And I'm gonna give myself a mark down that side and a mark down that side. Whoops. Yep. So I think, yeah, you can see those a little bit better. You can see that I'm marking them. And I'm marking on the back of my B blocks just because I am. It's kind of easier for me to see. It doesn't matter if you mark on the back of the A block or the B block. I would mark on the back of whatever is the lightest color, probably. So I bet you all are making some beautiful things lately. I know we've had such hot weather where we live that it just gives me more time to get in the studio and stitch because you're not going outside in 107 degree weather. Nope, you are not doing it. Now, I will say that this weekend, the temperature came back down to a normal summer temperature, like in the low 80s. It's been beautiful, really beautiful. The humidity came down a little bit. I think we might actually get a nice week, too, from what I've heard on the radio and the local news forecast. So that will be nice. I mark these while they're in the sets. Some folks will go through and just mark the one and then match them up. Either way is fine. There's no um, technical reason to go ahead and have them in sets as you mark or to mark them individually. Um, whatever you prefer, whatever you might be used to. 
Um, if you're brand new and you're following me, I stack mine and then I mark. There we go. All right, so those are all my A, B block sets. I'm gonna set those aside. Pulling over my B, C block sets. And you can see I've got all of my sets marked with a sticky note. I've just put the letters on them so I know what they are. After last week, I, you know, I always do that, but after last week, I'm like writing them, as you can see, in big letters. Last week, I was sewing everything together backwards and upside down, and I don't know what was wrong with me. I know I've heard some folks are losing their sewing mojo. You know, if that's the case, don't sew for a little bit. Maybe, maybe take the time to watch vid some videos, some sewing and crafting videos, maybe take the time to um, listen to some sewing or crafting podcasts or read some sewing or crafting books, something that might inspire you rather than the doing of the sewing, you know, to use something that might inspire you to get back into your sewing. Because we all go through those little peaks and valleys of having our mojo go out the window, goes on vacation, just picks up its bag and says, eh, I'm out of here, bye now. I only dislike that when it picks up its bags and goes out the window when I'm in the middle of something important. It's like, no, get back here. I have to have you here for at least another week. So I received a lovely gift today, back in February. Um, there is a lovely couple that lives next door to Dave and I. And back in February, she passed. And um, I've been very sad about that. She was a very lovely lady. And she was a stitcher. So, you know, she was a sister in stitches, right? We all have, when we have that in common, it's very special. And we lost her. And her husband has been doing well. Uh, but recently, he's had a little bit of a health concern, which is under control now, it's all good. But um, he's been going through, as you do when a loved one passes, going through her items and things. And he brought me some, a big box of her threads today. And um, I went outside and I talked to him for a bit and thanked him and we chatted for a while. And then I came inside and bawled like a baby because whenever I use them now, I will think of our lovely neighbor. And I'll think of the very first year we moved here, she made a little Christmas table runner for us, kind of like the 10 minute table runner. Um, if you look on my videos, you'll see um, a 10 minute table runner, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> oh my goodness. I am so sorry. Oh. Allergies just took over. I couldn't stop sneezing if I tried. So there are my AC sets. Okay, I have two of those. But um, she brought us the very first winter we lived here. She didn't really know us yet very well. And so she didn't know I was a stitcher yet. And um, she brought us a beautiful little uh, table runner in Christmas. And I put it out every year in my kitchen on my little coffee bar area. And um, so now every time I use these threads, I will think of her. She was a lovely, lovely lady. Okay, so um, yeah, and so if you want to do that 10 minute table runner that I was just mentioning, go into my videos here on YouTube, go down because it's going to be down. It was several months ago I did that video. Um, and I don't think I, it was just a Sunday video. It wasn't under any of the series names, um, but you'll see it'll say 10 minute table runner. It is literally 10 minutes and it's a lot of fun. All right, so I'm flipping my camera over to the sewing machine because now we're going to take our stack of half square triangle sets and we're going to sew. We're going to sew, sew, sew. All right, so as I always do, I'll give you a little setup information here. I'm using today, I'm using um, Orafil 50 weight 2021 thread. It's a white thread. It's what I had on here, so I'm not changing it, but you all know normally I piece with um, 2600, which is this light dove gray, um, but that's fine. We'll do the white today because that's what's there. So I'm going to start with my stack of AB fabrics. 
sets, okay? Oh, um, I'm using an 8012 uh, Microtex needle. Um, you could use a 7511 if you liked. Um, I recommend you use a sharp needle, regardless if you use a 7511 or an 8012. Um, I would suggest that you use a sharp needle for uh, patchwork piecing. It makes a cleaner stitch in your fabric. And I'm using a two and a half inch stitch length. Now, that being said, if you are someone who normally um, presses your seams open, then please use a stitch length of 1.8 or smaller, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, something like that. It will give you a stronger seam for opening those um, seams when you press, okay? So I've just got a white, white bobbin and I'm playing a little bit of bobbin roulette today. We may end up having to change this bobbin, but that's quick because this is a little drop in. So I'm setting up to stitch right down my uh, lines that I drew. Just kind of making sure everything's nice and lined up and getting my foot pedal where I can reach it. <laughs> Do you ever hate it when your foot pedal ends up like three feet in front of you and your foot just reaches out like it's trying to grab it? I usually can get it, but what I hate is when I have to crawl under the sewing table to find it. And it's on like a little non-slip mat and stuff. Doesn't matter, it still does its own thing. It's like my mojo. Sometimes it just gets up and does its own thing. So I'm just stitching directly down my lines and I'm gonna chain piece these sets. I'm going to break the thread between each set of blocks though, for like the AC, AB, though, that's those sets, just so I don't confuse them. And because I get a little worried when I chain piece, I tend to confuse things and get things backwards. I don't want to do that. Oops, oops, there we go. Okay, so we'll bring in the second one. It doesn't matter what order you sew these in, I'm just going to sew them all. Because when you do two sides, you don't get one straight line. You get a little bit of a, so now I've got one over here and one over here and I'll put the next one in. They don't just keep going straight through like um, when you do one side at a time. So I, I'm always afraid if I were to do all of these, I would end up getting something completely out of kilter and out of whack. And I would end up with a really, Nasty time. I don't know why I just put, I'm gonna put my, there we go, I'm gonna put my needle back down. I don't know why I lifted it up. You do not have to chain piece, by the way, not at all. Um, some people, I don't chain piece a lot. I try to on these videos so that it's faster and quicker for all of you to see. But when I'm sewing on my own, I don't chain piece typically. There's nothing wrong with doing it or not doing it. I just, um, I seem to get confused easily by the process. So, and I've been sewing for a long time. So, you know, everybody has their little thing. Well, chain piecing seems to be my little thing. All right, so this is the last sew line for this set of blocks. Now I'm going to go ahead and break my thread and see they're not in a whole line. They're kind of cattywampus, but interestingly enough, I can kind of set them up in a stack again, I think here. Totally weird. There, so I have them in a little set and I'm going to slap my little sticker back on them and set them to the side. Those are done. Now I've got my next set which are A and C blocks, okay. So here we go on these. And I'm just gonna 
There we go. Straighten that a little bit better. If you notice, I don't go zooming through my blocks. Does it take me a little more time? Yes, it does. But in all honesty, I have never been a speed stitcher. I like to take my time and be precise. And I know that if I speed stitch, the first thing that goes out the window is my precision. Um, so I don't, I leave my machine set, my machine seat speed set right in the center. I rarely ever go past that to the high end. I just feel like for me, I have better control. So if you have better control with your machine with the speed at the low end, feel free. If you're a super, super speedy sewer and you get precision at the high end, go for it. That's just not me. And also, you know, I, I don't mind if it takes me a little time. This is, I'm doing this for the enjoyment of it and for the, um, you know, for the stress reducefulness of it. That's not a word, right? But um, to reduce stress, you know, this is one of the things I do and I enjoy it. So I don't necessarily want it to go super fast. Okay, now this set of two blocks is done. And I'll stack those up and we'll put that sticky back on it. And we're gonna grab now our set of BC blocks. And I'll line those up. So how many of you out there, you can comment in the comments. I read all the comments. Um, how many of you out there have a feather a Singer Featherweight machine, a 220 or a 221? If you do, let us know and let us know why you love it so much. So um, I had a singer for a long time. And then when I went away to school, to college, my mother gave it away. So I now have it no more. And it makes me sad sometimes because it was a lovely little machine. I mean, I know why you all love it. They're lovely little machines. And um, it's a workhorse, right? I get that. And then the other night, my husband tells me, oh, well, my mom had one of those and she never used it. He says, I only remember her taking it out to um, do some hems on a pair of pants like once or twice. That was it. Now, my mother-in-law, bless her heart, rest her soul because she's passed. And that's why we were discussing it because we're still in the process of getting their funerals prepped and all because of COVID, we've had to, as a family, delay things. It's a little bit heartbreaking when you have to do that, to be honest. Um, but anyway, so we were talking about it and he said, oh yeah, she had, it. it was in the little case and it was in great shape and da da da. It was like new because she never used it. And I'm like, where, where is it, please? And he's like, oh, I have no idea. I don't even know if we still have it or, or you know, because their old home has been demolished and everything is with his brother and his family. So I think I'm going to do a little checking around though, because I think my mother-in-law, don't you think my mother-in-law would want me to have her singer featherweight? She never mentioned in all the time I knew her that she had a featherweight, but Anyway, and it sounds to me like it's practically brand new. So if I find it, I'll show it to you all. And I will be very blessed to have it if that turns out to be the case. We're done here. We're gonna go back over to our other camera. Um, and I will enjoy working with that little sewing machine if we were to ever find it. I honestly don't even know if it exists anymore. But if it does, yes, that would be wonderful. And every time I sew, I'll think of my mother-in-law who has a degree in home economics from Iowa State University. The woman never cooked. She never sewed. She was sweet as she can be. Let me tell you, she was born too early. She had been born now where girls are encouraged in math and science. She would have been out there to the moon. Seriously, that's the kind of mind she had. And her two brothers, my husband's two uncles, 
sometimes I'm a little hesitant to say this because one of them was on the Manhattan Project that helped develop the bomb. Also in his later life, he took that knowledge and helped develop like sustainable energy and stuff. So, you know, we don't brag about that, but the man was smart. They came and asked for him. And then his other uncle uh, worked for the war department in the army and helped develop um, biological weaponry with botulinum toxin. And do you know what we call that today? Botox. Very, very, very watered down minuscule uh, ideas of that is what we know as Botox. But regardless of what they did, it was the time. It's what we were doing as humanity. So I don't hold any like, oh my God, chemical, biological weapons. I, I don't hold that against them because that was the time in which we lived. I wasn't there. And I don't judge people. Don't do that. But they were brilliant men. Super brilliant. My husband's grandfather, super brilliant engineer, um, divine, uh, uh, helped design bridges between St. Louis and Illinois and all of that. And so really a, a super great, interesting family. And um, if I had ever been able to meet them, I know I'd love them dearly. Um, I've seen pictures and I can just, you can see in somebody's face, right? What they are in here. That's how I feel about those gentlemen. But that's how my mother-in-law would have been. Paul Mack should have never been her major in college. She should have been like a biology major, an engineering major, a math major, something like that, because that's the kind of brain she had born before her time in that respect. Coffee time. Okay, enough family history. I'm now going to take and use my little cutter and cut apart my blocks. So those are my BC blocks. Now we're gonna do our AC blocks, ACDC. Good band, right? AB blocks. And like I said, I just do mine this way too to help keep them organized. That way I'm not like forgetting stuff and all, which I tend to do. All right, I'm gonna flip the camera back over because now we're gonna cut and lay out and sew. Okay, here we go. Okay, let's go ahead and start with our AB blocks. Set that aside. Um, got my rotary cutter, got my ruler. I'm just going to put my quarter inch mark on my ruler on my sewn line here. You can do it on either side. Because I'm a lefty, it works for me to put it on this side. If you were a righty, you would want to put it over here because you'd be cutting with your right hand. Because I'm cutting with my left hand, I put it on this side. So either sewn line is fine because when you put that quarter inch mark on the sewn line, it basically puts your ruler right down the middle for when you make your cut. Okay, there's two. Just line this up and way to go. So anyway, we were talking about featherweights, right? So if you have a featherweight, tell us about it. Have you had it since you were young? Was it your mother's or your grandmother's or an aunt? Um, did you get it as a young woman? Um, have you gotten it recently? Like you knew all about these, but you got it recently. Oops, let me do a little cover here. Um, tell us about your featherweight because so this is the moral to the story, right? I'm on the lookout for one. If I ever find my mother-in-laws, I will just be overwhelmed, happy. I have a treadle. I have a seen on treadle um, in the cabinet, the whole bit. I love it. It was gifted to me recently. I grew actually grew up sewing on a Singer treadle. Um, my best friend's mother and my grandmother had one. But, um, and I was recently gifted one in the, um, in the, not the box, the um, cabinet, gosh. So now I'm going to set all my seams. Actually, whoops, I take that back. I'm gonna trim my seams first, or I'm gonna trim my 
blocks first. Um, I want to trim these down to four and a half inches. So I have four and a half here. I'm going to lay that four and a half on my sewn line. Let me get out my rotating mat. It makes this much easier. When I see people doing this kind of a thing and around, it just makes my heart beat a little funny. <laughs> All righty. You won't have too much to trim, actually. You trim these however you trim your half square triangles. That's fine. You just want to square them up to four and a half inches. But I will tell you, I really love this. This is a quilt in the day. A quilt in the day, um, six and a half inch triangle square ruler. And I love it. So anyway, I'm on a lookout for a nice little featherweight that I can even if I have to restore it, I will. I just want one back. They're such lovely little machines to use. Um, I know they're kind of trendy now, and I think that's why I've been seeing some of them for over $4,000. Good night. I had no idea. I won't be spending that kind of money. Can't do that. Um, that's why, you know, if I can find my mother-in-law's, I'd be thrilled. And if I can find one that needs to be cleaned and maintenance and all, I will certainly do that um, if it's a reasonable price where having it maintenance and all won't end up being $4,000, just can't do that. In all honesty, it would be more of a nostalgia thing for me because I love it and I grew up using them. Um, but so if you know, now I know of the, I know of the featherweight shop and they have some that are in like the $600 range right now. I don't know if they're in stock with them or not. I saw pictures, some of them, when I went to look, they said sold out. So I don't know if they actually have them or not. I, I'll look some more. I would probably go that high if it was ready to, ready to go. So I know about the featherweight shop. And the ones I've seen on Etsy were all people wanting $4,000 for them. I just, no, can't do that. But if you know of a place that has one, if you have one, you don't want it anymore, I will give you a fair price. I won't give you $4,000. I won't give you probably much over six, <laughs> especially if it needs work, but. Anyway, that's beyond the point. My point is I want to hear about your stories if you have a featherweight, because they're super fun. I have a featherweight foot in my drawer over by my machine, and it actually fits my brother machine. Can you believe that? It does. It fits my brother machine, and sometimes I put it on there when I'm just sewing by myself, because it works really great. And um, I love using it. I love, I, it is a thin foot. If you have a featherweight, you know it's a very thin foot and I love it. Some people don't like those thin foot feet, um, but I do. I have to sew a little differently on that machine. Um, I have to use leaders and trailers, you know, spiders, whatever they call them. Um, I have to do that to get it to work well in my, so it doesn't suck everything down into the feed dogs, but. It's over there. It's waiting for its true little machine to come along eventually. Have you made a quilt on your featherweight? I have a friend right now who's working on a quilt on her featherweight who lives kind of close to me. So I wish her all the best on that. Her husband took a picture of her working away and it looked like it was all going really well. So I'm gonna go ahead and trim all of these up so I can get my rotating mat off the pay, off the table before I go and um, press and all. It'll be more efficient that way. And for me, efficiency keeps me from getting out the seam ripper more than is advisable. 
So this is my AC set, okay? And just like with the others, I'm trimming them all to four and a half inches. If you don't have a rotating mat, really think about getting one for the safety concern, if nothing else, because you're not you know, doing this backwards toward yourself kind of sewing, which is going to end up getting you cut. I just give a listen on that one. Ask me how I know. I'll be honest and tell you. Um, now, some of them can be a little expensive, these turning mats. Um, but you'll notice that the one I have is a Fiskars. And I got it. I'm going to say the dreaded word. I got it at Joanne's several years ago, many years ago. And um, I used a 40% off coupon and it clicked right into my budget. I like that. And um, I use it a lot. I have a smaller one too that I use. Um, but it works well. Um, it doesn't have the... Um, the ball bearings in it like some of them do. I'll show you here how this one's made, but it works just as well as any other. It's got good markings on it, so it's easy for me to use it for marking. So I'll take this off real quick. This one just lifts off. See this little round bump here? And the inside has a little space and they just, there we go, they just snap together. And so they work fine. I was thinking there's a beautiful one. I think it's by Sue Daly. She does a lot of English paper piecing. I think that's basically what she's known for is her EPP. And um, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful um, rotating mat. It, it's round, it's got ball bearings, so it's smooth. But in all honesty, it's probably a little out of my price range. Not that it's not worth it. I'm not saying that. I think it probably is worth it. I'm just not at that point. I have other things I need to think about these days. You know, we all have priorities we have to think about, right? So maybe someday. But in all honesty, this one works great. So I really don't need another one. Having the newest trick on the block isn't necessarily, I have to be careful of that sometimes because I love gadgets, thus the whole good gadget series, right? So this is my BC set. We're almost done. As soon as we do these, we're ready to flip and press and start doing our layout. So I'm, if you're wondering, I know usually I don't necessarily go through the whole sewing process with you on my videos because I was thinking that folks really didn't want to see the whole process, that they wanted you know, a good overview and a good understanding, but they didn't necessarily want to see me sewing all of them. And about three weeks ago, I got six messages from different people, people who don't know each other from Eve. And they all said to me, would you please do the whole thing soup to nuts? Really want to see the process. If you guys want it, I'm willing to do it. Just means you have to listen to me gab on. <laughs> but I am more than happy to let the camera roll so that you can see the whole process. And I do apologize if it's made any of these difficult for you. If you have any questions at all on this video or any of my previous videos or any of my videos to come, you know, you can contact me at Sew in Common on Facebook or Sew in Common the group if you're part of the group. Um, the group is a nice safe place for folks to get together and share their knowledge and share their makes. Um, you can also contact me here in the comments section on YouTube. You can also contact me through my website. Lots of ways to get a hold of me. All right, so all of my blocks are trimmed up. Now there's one more part of the trimming I'm going to do, but I don't need my rotating mat for that. 
I don't know if you all have seen this yet because I can't remember if I've shown it to you. So um, I have a friend, her name is Chris Thurgood. Yes, if you know her, that Chris Thurgood. She's the owner and operator of the lovely shop out in Utah, um, my girlfriend's quilt shop. And Chris does a thing when she's getting ready to flip and press her half square triangles that I have adopted now. I don't know if it's her original idea, but she gets all the credit because I learned it from her. Um, and it's magnificent. I, you know, I don't know if it actually saves time, but in my brain it does, so I go with it. So as we can see right now, we're, we, we could take this over to our iron, press it open, and look, we have a dog ear, what we call a dog ear here and a dog ear here, and we'd have to come out and press the, or cut those off at the end. Technically, you don't have to, but they do make your seams and your where your things come together a little thick. They're a little hefty, so I take those off. So what Chris does and what I've taken to doing is I take my rotary cutter. See, right there is the end of my sew line where my thread is, so I'm not, you know, cutting into here. And I just bring my thing at an angle and cut it off. See, just at an angle. I don't know what the angle is. I don't care what the angle is. I just cut it in enough that now when I take it and press it, she calls this her Superman cut, I think, because it kind of comes out looking like the Superman shield because now we have those little angles there. But now when I open up and press, look how pretty that's gonna be with no dog ears. So I just pre, it's really just, pre-dog earring, clipping your, I don't know, you can call it what you like, but I do that on all of mine now, and I really like it. I honestly don't know that it saves time, but while I'm in here cutting things, I might as well do it and have that part done, right? Because then once I press, I'm ready to lay out and go, um, lay out my squares and go back to the machine and sew. All right, so there's that set pre-cut. Now we'll do this set. I could do them while I'm, I guess, while I was doing the trimming up. But since I had my trim up ruler and all, all going, it's easier to do all of them that way than come in and do all of this for me. But I'm not telling you you have to do it that way. Nope, nope, nope. Do whatever makes you happy in your sewing process. So again, I don't know if Chris says this or where I heard it from. Um, I know I've heard it on TV, but I've heard it in the quilting sewing world recently. You do you, do your thing. You do what, what works for you. This is your craft. This is your art. This is what makes you happy. My idea is learn all the things, find out all the things. If you get the opportunity to learn something new, learn something new, and then you can decide whether or not it's something that fits your process or not. So I've learned lots of techniques and things over the years. And at the time I go, eh, yeah, not, not gonna really use this. I like what I do now and that's cool. And then down the road some at some point I go, oh, you know what? I learned that process once. And I think in this particular case, it could really be helpful. And I use it and it is helpful. So it is never, a bad thing to learn new techniques and new ideas, never ever. Whether or not you use them is completely up to you if and when you ever use them. But knowing that might also help you help someone else if they're having a problem like with the technique you've shown them or a technique that they've learned that you know and they're having a problem with it and you know another technique, maybe something you know may help them. So, my, my idea is learn all the stuff and then use what works for you. And just the rest of it will just stay in your little quilting brain encyclopedia, all nice and tucked away. All right, so now everything is clipped from A to Z. <laughs> we're gonna bring in the mat and we're going to press these open now. So this is my AC set. And I press mine to the dark. Um, 
my hang up isn't to press to the dark. My hang up is to press to whatever side is appropriate for this block. In this block, it just works out that pressing to the dark side works for all of them. If you are doing a pattern and a pattern gives you directions on how to press, go ahead and try that because it's probably going to make your pressing and the way your um, block turns out and your quilt turns out work out better. Because like I say, the, the designer, she's already taken, she or he have already taken the time to figure out what works easiest. So, you know, I always use the precision piecing pen to condition my seams. Oops, I forgot to set my seam here. Let me turn that over, press my seam. There we go. Open this up. Oh, look, no doggy ears. I like that. And with the precision piecing pen, it gives me this lovely flat little, oh, look how nice that looks on the back. I really like that when things turn out that way. Now I'm going to set a clapper on there. Not the clap on, clap off with the lights thing. The um, Taylor's clapper. If you don't know what that is, you can find out. Just go watch. I think it was my very first or second Good Gadgets episode. I talk about this and I talk about that clapper. I try not to go over it every time I do this in every single video because those of you that watch all the time, I know get tired of listening to it. So it's just easier to tell you where to go find it. But as always, if you have any questions, you just let me know. Oops. We're going to have to put some more stuff in this pen. I think it's getting dry. So the nice thing about this is it's constantly refillable. So I fill it about halfway and when it gets to where it's not, you know, wetting my seam, I'm not seeing it come out of the end onto my seam, then I know it's time to unscrew down here at the bottom and fill it back up. Oh, I like this little so this little B fab or C fabric, it's my C fabric, this one, that's light and all. It's not part of this collection, but I like how it goes with it. I think it's pretty. Yep, so that's four. So that's my AC blocks. I'm gonna set those there and just let the clapper sit on them while I start the next set. And when I start the next set, I'll move those out. Okay, so I'm gonna turn these over because I wanna do the dark side. Oh, I really want to say go to the dark side, Luke, but I know people get tired of hearing that. I'm such a science fiction nut. You know, I never was either. I never was. I've been, you know, I've wanted to be a scientist and all my hope since I was little, little, little. Um, so I'm going to set that set aside now. Let me start doing this one. Um, and, but I never read science fiction as a kid because I thought it was kind of horny. And boys read it, right? All the, let's just say it, girls. We thought of it and it wasn't nice, but the geeky boys. Little did I know that I was a geeky girl, but I was. <laughs> um, and then when I was in high school, my high school librarian, she introduced me to a group of books by an author named Zilpha Keatley Snyder. She wrote a series, a, a trilogy called Below the Root, about the society that lived below the root tree. Think about that for a moment, right? It's an excellent series. Now, I was in high school and she said, this might be a little beyond you. And I'm like, seriously? I've been reading since I was three, lady. This is not going to be beyond me. I mean, my mom used to let me read her book of the month novels. I read the Kennedy Report and stuff like that when I was, you know, five or six. <laughs> anyway, um, but that series by Zilpha Keatley Snyder, I just adored it. I adored the characters and the ideas. And that got me really going into science fiction. All right, so on this set is A, B. This is A, this is B. I'm going to choose B to remain my dark fabric. Okay, I'm not going to use that one as my dark. 
And so that's when I started reading some science fiction and I started like really like researching authors and stuff because I was, I've always been a big reader and um, now I just love it. Can't get enough of it, cannot get enough of it. If it's done well, if it's not done well, you know, don't bother me. But because I tend not to follow the trend, if I hear something's good, I have to go and research it, like, it's, you know, going away tomorrow before I make that decision. Just who I am. Alrighty. So this is our AB stack. This is our biggest stack of half square triangles. As soon as we're done with this one, we're gonna start laying our block out and sewing it together. This fabric is really beautiful. Um, this is actually a fairly new fabric. I don't have the name for you. On these videos, I don't give you the names of fabrics because I choose fabrics out of my stash. And sometimes I don't have those names and I'm sorry. On my um, sewing common ones, I try to always use fabrics that are current that you could go and find. And I try and tell you who those uh, designers are. Um, it just so happens that this particular set of fabric, this collection, is on the market and fairly new. Oh, it's called Flowers for Freya, F-R-E-Y-A, you know, the goddess of love and motherhood and marriage and home. The, um, if you know the Wagner opera series, The Ring Cycle, Freya is the wife of Wotan, the king of the gods. It's called Flowers for Freya. I'm pretty sure it's a Moda fabric, but don't completely quote me on that. But I know the name of the collection is Flowers for Freya. And I think it's beautiful. It's these colors that I love. The navies, the aquas, the teals. Okay, this is our second to the last one. Look at how nicely these go when you have those dog ears pre-trimmed. I love that idea, Chris Thurgood. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That little tip, I just love it. All right, so I'm gonna put my pen away for now, my conditioning pen. And this is my last one. I'm just going to put the clapper on there. And I like to put my elbows on it for a minute and count to five and then done. All right, so I have all of my sets. Set those over here. And I'm going to take away the mat and the iron and the clapper. All right, so I'm going to lay my three sets out. B, C, A, C, A, B. And I'm going to bring in my original block. So I set this out right. So that is a B, A, yeah, A, B. So I want to start here. So your A, B blocks are going to go in your four corners. Like this. So you're going to have in your upper left corner, you're going to have your B block in the upper left. Like this. And so your A block is what you would call in your lower half, upper half, lower half, okay? Now, your far right corner is going to have the A side up in the upper half, the B side background in the lower half. I'm gonna slide those up a little bit because we're gonna start, we're gonna start getting kind of crowded here. Let me see if I can get this any better for us. There we go, that might help a little bit. Okay. So far left, far right. Now we're gonna go to the bottom left corner. And the B background is in the upper quadrant. Oh, we can't see that now because now I have it too far up. Doggone it. There we go. Okay. Upper 
uh, quadrant, a fabric lower quadrant. Over in the far right side, we're going to have it with the B fabric in the lower quadrant and the A fabric in the upper quadrant going in this direction. So we're going to kind of lay those out like that. Now, right next to the lower left one, you're going to do another AB square. And you are going to match it up where the A fabric is in the upper left and the B fabric is in the bottom right. So can you see how it's making a uh, diagonal strip right there. So you want to make sure you've got that strip going on. Now, in over on, let's see, let's, let's go ahead and, and do this row now. Let's, let's continue by rows now. So we're working on the very bottom row. Okay. Next to this one, we want to use a BC fabric square. We want the B fabric to match up next to this B fabric and the C fabric to be right there. Okay. So you can see that little peak right there. And then here on the far side, we want that because we're four blocks across. So we want the B fabric down here and the A fabric up here. Okay, that's our bottom row, or we'll call this row one because we'll go from the bottom to the top. So this is row one. Okay, now we're going to start on row two. So we are going to take a BC fabric square and we are going to put it with fabric C in the bottom right and fabric B in the top left. Next to it, we want an AC square. I'll take one of those off my pile. And we want A in the bottom right and C in the top left. Now look what we're doing. We're getting a diagonal going this way and we're continuing the diagonal we started here, okay? Right next to it, we want another AC square. And we want C to be in the bottom left and A to be in the top right. Because this four patch in the middle is actually gonna end up being a pinwheel. So now we want another AB fabric square. And we want A in the bottom left and B in the top right. Look what we're doing here we're getting an angle going here too, okay? All right, slide this down a little bit now, okay? Now we're on starting row three, row three. Okay, we start row three with an AB square with B in the bottom left and A in the top right. So again, we have that peak right here. So we have a peak here and a peak here. Guess what? We're gonna end up with a peak here and a peak up here too, right? You can see that coming, I bet. So now we're going to take an AC square and we're going to put A in the bottom left, C in the upper right. So we've got the third side of our pinwheel now, but look, here we have that diagonal line starting there. Can you see how that works? Okay. Now we want our very last AC square and we want A in the top right and C in the bottom left. And look just at those four squares right there. We have a nice little pinwheel, four patch pinwheel right there. Okay. And you can see over here we have another diagonal going. Okay. Now on the far end here, we want a BC square, right, BC, yes. So we want B in the bottom right and C in the top left. So there we have our diagonal 
There we have our point. That's row three. Now I am gonna back this up some so we can put row four right up here. So we're going to start with an AB block and we want B in the upper right and A in the bottom left. Ooh, look, there's our diagonal, see? You can start to see it coming together. Now, our next one is our BC, and we want C in the bottom left and B in the top right, C, B. There we have our little, see these are becoming our star points. These diagonals are our star points. These diagonals are the windmill, windmill part coming out. Can you see how that's coming together? I know it's a little bit difficult on with this camera and all. I'm doing my best for you. All right, so now we want a, a B square and we want B in the upper left, A in the bottom right. So there's our peak, there's our fourth peak right there. And there is our windmill going off in this direction. And then we should have one square left, which is an AB square. And we want it with A in the upper left, B in the bottom right. So we have our windmill being made by our A fabric, our star being made by our C fabric, and then our B fabrics are becoming our background. All right, not difficult, not difficult at all. I'm gonna set the, the one that's finished behind. Now, since you all asked, for me to do this from soup to nuts. I'm gonna go ahead and sew this with you right here, okay? If you don't need to see how it's sewn together, you can turn off the video at this point. But for those of you that wanted to, we're gonna start. We're gonna start down here on row one. Oh, let me bring the camera back this way a little. There we go. So here we are at row one. It's the bottom. It's the one closest to me, closest to my tummy. Okay, so I start in the right and go to the left. You might start on the left and go to the right, doesn't matter. But I am going to take my far right block and I am going to flip it over on top of the block right next to it. Now, you won't see me do this very much, but because I have been having this thing of sewing in the wrong direction, sewing things together incorrectly, I'm putting a pin in here with my pin head at the top pointing down, telling me that I need to sew right here. <laughs> I honestly don't know what's wrong with me these days. All right, so we're gonna go and, now this is gonna take a little bit because I do mine, I, it's like I told you with my speed, I don't do it fast. I could go ahead and do that and do my pin and all, but trust me, by the time I did that, I would end up doing a mistake, it's just, the way things are going lately, I don't know. I'm gonna flip my camera. We're gonna go over to the sewing machine. I'm really someone that hates doing seam ripping. So, all right, so I've got my, my blocks right here. I'm gonna go ahead and take my pin out now because I'm at the machine. I know where I need to sew. Now I'm gonna take and just make sure I'm all lined up where I want to be. Now, your kind of industry standard, if you want to call it that, seam allowance for patchwork is a quarter of an inch. So I know that my quarter inch is right there. So that's what I follow. You can use, um, you can use this kind of marking tape uh, to help you with quarter inch. You might have a special quarter inch foot. I'm using my walking foot. So, um, but I do have a quarter inch foot as well. Let me see, do I have one really close that I can show you? Um, oh, that, that's my featherweight foot I was telling him about. Um, okay, I don't have my quarter inch foot out at the moment, um, but there's a quarter inch foot. I bet you, you have one for your sewing machine. Okay, let me pull this out. 
snip my threads, snip these threads. Now we're gonna go press these open and work on the next set of two. I'm gonna press these open. I'm, I'm not gonna flip the camera back around, okay? Well, actually, maybe I should do one more. There, okay. So I'm gonna bring this over here. I'm over here at my mat. I'm going to um, set my scene. Condition. And I trim as I go. So if I find that I need to do a little trimming, I do that as I go. That's just my way. Some people trim up everything at the very end. That's fine too. I just trim it while I know I need to. So let's turn this back over here. So I've got my, well, you can't see this. Let's see. Just trying to slide everything a little bit. There we go. You can see this now. So I just know I need to trim ever so the tiniest bit off. So I'm going to do it while I've got it here. See, just threads. Okay, that's good. All right, so now this goes back where it came from. This is my outside corner. This is the next one into it. We're good, and it's gonna sit there for now while I work on these two. Um, let's slide everything back over. Um, I need to figure out. So I try to make this camera on a stand work. It's got an arm so that Dave didn't have to put a pole from the top of the ceiling down and stuff, but I think we're really gonna have to do that. I just think that's gonna have to be the case. So I'm lining these up, but I need to flip them because I'm so right here in this direction. So take myself a little pin, put it right here. So I know where to, to sew when I get over to my machine. Flip the camera. And here I am, all lined up. And I'm not going to hit my pin, so I'm not even going to bother. Whoops, my foot down. So I'm not even going to bother to take it out because I know I'm not going to hit it. I'm not coming anywhere near it. And trim my little threads. Go back over. Now, flip the camera again. There we go. So I flipped this so I could sew it here, right? So I'm gonna flip it back this way now because I know that's the order it actually goes in. I'm gonna take my pin out and then I'll bring it over and press it. I know you're not seeing the pressing, but I'm not doing anything different than I didn't do on all of those half square triangles, so. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to end up getting a, an overhead from the ceiling so that the camera can come right down on top of this and see more of the board. Okay. So I've got those back into place. Now I know they're in the right order because I can still see my windmill here. I can see my star point here, my windmill here. So I'm good. So now I have two sections. I'm gonna fold this one over on top of this section and we're gonna go and sew these together. And now I'm not gonna do the pin this time because I'm just dealing with the two sections. There's only one place, one short side that I can do this on. Line it up and away we go. Okay. 
So because these, these videos are going to be a little bit longer now because I'm doing all of the, um, all of the sewing of the final block together, I want you to know that fast forward through any of this you don't wanna see, okay? It's perfectly all right. Now I'm gonna open these up and we'll have one whole row done. A complete row will be done. And when you're at home sewing, this will go quicker. Because you have your, like everything, you have your rhythm, what you're doing. Okay, look, Ooh, look, we have a beautiful point here. All came together. Lovely, right? So now I'm gonna actually set this right over here so that you can see me working right here a little bit. So I'm gonna do the same thing. We put these two together. And we'll put a pin in here. So I could say that this whole idea of having to use this pin right now is maybe my mojo did go. Maybe it got up and went on vacation last week. Because I was certainly making mistake after mistake last week, I tell you for sure. Okay. Make sure everything is lined up. So until I trust myself that I'm out of whatever rut or craziness was going on in my brain, this pin and I are going to be friends for a little while. <laughs> and yep, it sure does. It takes me longer. It sure does take me longer, but that's okay. I am not erasing. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and press this open. Okay, it looks like I'm gonna need one tiny little, just itty bitty little bit of trimming on this one. It's okay. Okay, now I put this back down. I'm going to slide my bottom row over to make sure everything's going in the right direction. Is that how that was supposed to be? Yep. Because you can, let me see something here. No, something's wrong. See, something is wrong. Well, I sewed it together right, but why is this wrong? Why is this wrong? This should be a C, B square. Oh. I see what I did. Oh, well, flipped me out. There we go. Whew. I had C, I had flipped this bottom one and I thought I had put these squares together wrong. Oh, I almost had a heart attack, guys. Seriously, almost. Take a deep breath, Diana. Take a deep breath. Oh. All right. So see, we've got our windmill coming here. There's our point. There's our windmill. Okay, we're in good shape. Now we're going to go on to this set. I really thought I had messed that up. I thought, surely not. I used the pin and everything. Ah. So I think what I might do I might ask Dave if he can start doing a little editing on these to speed up this part so you don't have to watch it in real time. You can watch it in sped up time. It just, he works so much and it really takes, it takes him a while to do it. So I don't like to take all his editing time. I know he doesn't mind, but we'll see. Like I said, if you, if you, 
aren't, I'm going to flip this again. If you aren't um, needing to watch this part, then by all means, just fast forward through. You won't be hurting my feelings any, I understand, but I want to do this for everybody who wanted to see it. Okay, so now we put this back in here. Yep, 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 that's lined up. I'm gonna actually slide this, I didn't flip it. And then I'm gonna put these two together. And go back over to the sewing machine. Now, I know some people would say, Diana, put all those blocks on your, um, put all those blocks on your design board and carry them over to your machine and just sew everything and then come back and iron. I can't do it that way. It's a lovely idea. And those of you that can do it that way, more power to you. But that is the very thing that will get me confused. It's always been that way for me. This isn't that part of it isn't something new. Um, I have to do things in a very chronological order. And because of the way I have the room set up right now, it just means a lot of up, up and down, walking back and forth. But I don't mind. If you guys don't mind hanging on with me, then we're good. Flip the cameras again. Whoops, flip the camera again. And I'm opening this up and I'm going to press. Okay. All right, so here is block one. Nope, I'm sorry, there we go, there we go. All right, so now we have these two together. I know these two are in the right order, right? I know they are correct. I'm gonna take this one and turn it on top of this one. And now have you all seen these two headed pins? They're fabulous for putting your seams together. I mean, fabulous. If my seams aren't going both in the same direction to nest, all I do is press one in the other direction with my fingers and put this little pin in here. Just trying not to pin my fingers. There we go. These make such a nice difference. And then when I come back, I will actually press this to this side. Yeah, that's good. Okay. I like to press at my, or I like to pin at where these points and seams come together. We used to use these pins in retail a thousand years ago. And I found these again through Lori Holt. She uses them and this is actually her product, her set of pins. And I love them, they just work really well. You know, I always use my little wonder clips and I like those, but I really find that these double armed pins really hold it together nicely. I mean, it holds it, your, your seam isn't going nowhere. Okay, so I have my whole row put together. Now we're gonna take this to the machine and sew it. And then the whole bottom half of the row is gonna be over. And to be honest, I'm not gonna hold you while I do the top half, because seriously, it's done the same exact way. And I think you've seen me doing it now enough. I will show you the whole finished block. Um, well, you've seen it in the, in the picture, but um, to hold you together while I sew the top half together um, is just kind of a waste of your time, seriously, because it is done exactly the way I've just done this bottom half. And then you put the top half and the bottom half together like I'm doing these two rows now.
almost done here. All right. So we're just about done here, guys, because I'm only going to sew this bottom half seriously. It would be another 30 minutes for me to do the upper half. And those of you that don't need to see it would be hating me. I know it for true. I know it for true. Okay. So I'm going to slide my other blocks up. I'm going to bring this pressing mat in here. And so I want to show you what I do here. If my seams, if I've had to hand press over my seam, what I do is I come in right here next to the seam and clip up to the line. I don't, I don't clip the actual seam line. I just clip up to it, right? And then they fold back so that they lay properly. And I just give them a little press press them down. Now, with these longer seams, I don't use the conditioning pen. What I use instead, oh, you could use steam or water. I know some of you don't like it, that's fine. Or you could use, I use this magic sizing. I love this. It's the extra crisp and I find it not to be extra crisp but I just give a light little spray there on that seam. That's all I do. They have a regular strength too. Um, I find it doesn't quite press quite as much as I need it to. And the, the extra crisp really isn't all that extra crisp. It's not like using, it's not like using um, Tyrael Magic or, or a starch. And now I'm just pressing this out. I need to see if I can find a Taylor's clapper that is 16 inches long. I don't know if I've ever seen one that long. I'll have to check around because what I try to do is while I'm really getting one seam going well or one side, then I switch. I actually should just have Dave cut me one. I've got another one over there that is one he cut me from a piece of scrap wood and it works perfectly. Should have him just cut me a longer one. Okay, now with that done, I'm gonna look at my back seams. Okay, so right there, that's popped up a little bit. I wanna give that a little press. There, that's good. Put that down, everything else looks great actually, so I'm not worried about doing that. All right, so let's slide that over. All right, guys, so here we go. Let's bring in our the squares we still have. So I'm gonna do the exact same thing that I just did on the bottom two rows to these top two rows. And when I'm done, I'm gonna flip this half onto this half and it's going to come together. You can already see the bottom half of it. You can see my star points. You can see my windmill points. You'll see the whole block finished. Well, you've seen the whole block finished in the um, thumbnail for this video. So you'll see it. Wow, I really think it turned out pretty with these fabrics. I like these a lot. This might be a group of fabrics I need to check in getting more of. All right, so let me flip the camera around again. One more cycle. There we go. All right, guys, so that is the windmill block. I'm just putting my scissors on. That's the windmill block. So that's the half we finished, and I'm just going to go finish the other half. Exactly the same way, exactly. No difference, I don't do anything different. And then I sew the two halves together, press the chain down, it's done. And we end up with this beautiful block. So I love this one too, I love these fabrics. And they're kind of in that same blues and greens like this one I did today. So what I could do, if I could come up with a couple more sets of these colors, put four of them together would make a nice wall hanging or we have a square dining table. Well, lovely right in the center of my table and it would be almost big enough to cover most of the table. I would take it off all the eat, but so I might do that with it. If I do, I'll let you know, I'll show you a picture. 
if you do this block or any of the blocks in the library or any of the blocks that I'm showing you over at So In Common Sundays or in any of my videos or anything that you've made that has nothing to do with anything that I've shown you, but stuff you've made that you want to share so that we can encourage and, and get inspired to do stuff ourselves, please come and join us at So In Common, the group on Facebook. I know Facebook is, you know, gets a little bit of a bad rap these days, but believe me, I do everything in my power to keep safe uh, the Facebook group a safe place for you to be. There's no outside advertisements. If there's anything advertised in there, it's something that I put in there that I'm offering for you guys to be able to, like a workshop or something, basically. Um, but I don't let people come into the group from like unknown places where they have like three people and they just signed up an account. Of course, you're getting hacked that way, right? We don't do that. Please come join us. Share all the beautiful stuff you make. I'd so love to see it. And so would everybody else. If you're too shy to do that, I get you. I get you. Sometimes you got to ease your way into stuff. I get that. Hashtag so beautiful, S-E-W, beautiful, H-C, on your pictures when you post them. And then we can take a look at them. Because when you type in hashtag in and, and whatever the hashtag is, then you can see all the posts for that hashtag. And so then I can I can see some of your beautiful stuff too, because I really would love to. I know that there are so many talented people out there making things and I'd love to see them. Alrighty, thank you so much for spending your time with me. Have a great day. As I always say, go so life beautiful. Bye now. <laughs>